Carl Jung was involved and experienced many paranormal activities which focused around the occult, many which were caused by the use of seance. In his book, Memories, Dreams and Reflections, an account is made of paranormal experiences occurring during his student years around about the time of 1895. During the summer holidays in his late teenage years, something happened that was destined to influence him profoundly, causing it to play a heavy influence on his future work, which he is well known for today. As I quote from the book, One day I was sitting in my room, studying my textbooks. In the adjoining room, the door to which stood ajar, my mother was knitting. That was our dining room, where the round walnut dining table stood. The table had come from the dowry of my paternal grandmother, and was at this time about 70 years old. My mother was sitting by the window, about a yard away from the table. My sister was at school, and our maid was in the kitchen. Suddenly, there sounded a report like a pistol shot. I jumped up and rushed into the room from which the noise of the explosion came from. My mother was sitting and flabbergasted in her armchair, the knitting falling from her hands. She stammered up, saying, what's happened? It was right beside me, and stared at the table. Following her eyes, I saw what had happened. The tabletop had split from the rim to beyond the center, and not along any joint. The split ran right through the solid wood. I was thunderstruck. How could such a thing happen? A table of solid walnut that had dried out for 70 years, how could it split on a summer day in the relatively high degree of humidity characteristic of our climate? If it had stood next to a heated stove on a cold, dry winter day, then it might have been conceivable. What in the world could have caused such an explosion? There certainly are curious accidents, I thought. My mother nodded darkly. Some two weeks later, I come home at 6 o'clock in the evening and found the household. My mother, my 14-year-old sister, and the maid in a great state of agitation. About an hour earlier, there had been another deafening report. This time it was not the already damaged table. The noise had come from the direction of the sideboard, a heavy piece of furniture dating from the early 19th century. They had already looked all over it, but had found no trace of a split. I immediately began examining the sideboard and the entire surrounding area, but just as fruitlessly. Then I began on the interior of the sideboard in the cupboard containing the bread basket. I found a loaf of bread and beside it, the bread knife. The greater part of the blade had snapped off in several pieces. The handle lay in one corner of the rectangular basket and in each of the other corners lay a piece of the blade. The knife had been used shortly before at 4 o'clock tea and afterward put away. Since then no one had gone to the sideboard. The next day I took the shattered knife to one of the best cutlers in town. He examined the fractures with a magnifying glass and shook his head. This knife is perfectly sound, he said. There is no fault in the steel. Someone must have deliberately broke it piece by piece. It could be done, for instance, by sticking the blade into the crack of the drawer and breaking off a piece at a time. Or else it might have been dropped on a stone from a great height. But good steel can't explode. Someone has been pulling my leg. I have carefully kept the pieces of the knife to this day. My mother and my sister had been in the room when the sudden report had made them jump. My mother's number two looked at me meaningfully, but I could find nothing to say. I was completely at loss and could offer no explanation of what had happened. And this was all the more annoying as I had to admit that I was profoundly impressed. Why and how did the table split and the knife shatter? The hypothesis that it was just a coincidence went much too far. It seemed highly improbable to me that the Rhine would flow backward just once by mere chance, and all other possible explanations were automatically ruled out. So what was it? A few weeks later I heard of certain relatives who have been engaged for some time in table turning, and also had a medium, a young girl of 15 and a half. A group had been thinking of me having meet the medium, who produced somnambulistic states and spiritualistic phenomena. When I heard this, I immediately thought of the strange manifestations in our house, and I conjectured that they might be somehow connected with this medium. I therefore began attending the regular seances with my relatives held every Saturday evening. We had results in the form of communications and tapping noises from the walls and the table. Movements of the table independently of the medium were questionable, and I soon found that the limiting conditions imposed on the experiment generally had an obstructive effect. I therefore accepted the obvious autonomy of the tapping noises and turned my attention to the content of the communications. I set forth the results of these observations in my doctoral thesis. After about two years of experimentation, we all began rather wary of it. I caught the medium trying to produce phenomena by trickery, and this made me break off the experiments. 
very much to my regret, for I had learned from this example how a number two personality is formed, how it entered into a child's consciousness and finally integrates it into itself. She was one of these precociously matured personalities, and she died of tuberculosis at the age of 26. I saw her once again when she was 24 and received a lasting impression of the independence and maturity of her personality. After her death, I learned from her family that during the last months of her life, her character disintegrated bit by bit, and that ultimately she returned to the state of the two-year-old child, in which condition she fell into her last sleep. All in all, this was the one great experience which wiped out all my earlier philosophy and made it possible for me to achieve a psychological point of view. I had discovered some objective facts about the human psyche, yet the nature of the experience was such that once again I was unable to speak of it. I knew no one to whom I could have had told the whole story. Once more I had to lay aside an unfinished problem. It was not until two years later that my dissertation appeared." End quote. It is said in a bibliography of Carl Jung called Aryan Christ, The Secret Life of Carl Jung, claiming that Carl Jung and a circle of only females gathered in secret to contact the spirit world. This must be after the paranormal activities occurred, but it also might be that these seances somehow could have caused them in the first place as they were supposedly happening beforehand. In this bibliography it is said that Jung invited four female relatives to participate in an experiment at his home. During around this time, Reverend Paul Young, his father, died and not sure after, Rudolf Prizwerk also died, who was the father of the two female participants that were involved in the seances, one called Helene Prizwerk, or Heli. It is then said by Richard Knoll that, that Jung learned a lot from the Prizwerk family, such as techniques for his own form of mediumship, a practice he would later legitimise in Zurich in 1916 with the term active imagination. Stephanie Zumstein Prizwerk, who was niece of Heli, wrote a book called C.J. Jung's Medium, which combines information from unpublished family documents. It is said in the Aryan Christ book on Carl Jung that quotes from this book that during the first seance, the glass of water on the table began to shake violently. By these accounts, Heli Prizwerk started to speak, saying, Grandfather visits us. I must set off on a journey, ask where he sends me, it's my place to accept. She then fell to the floor. Young supposedly picked her up and placed her on the sofa with help from others. She then woke and began to respond, but in the book it claims that she was possessed by her grandfather, where he was acting as the primary spokesman during the first three of the 1895 seances, acting as a sort of spiritual guide or control for Heli. Heli produced further voices, but the most interesting was this spirit named Ivines, who named herself as the real Helen Prizework. This character was much more mature, confident and intelligent than Heli, who Jung described as absent-minded and not particularly bright, talented or educated. It was as if buried beneath the unremarkable teenager was a fuller, more commanding personality like Jung's other. This was an insight into the psyche that would inform his later theory of individuation, the process of becoming who you are. Heli did blossom later, becoming a successful dressmaker in France, although she did die young. In Jung's dissertation on the seances, on the psychology and pathology of so-called occult phenomena, he described Heli unflatteringly as exhibiting slightly rachitic skull formation and somewhat pale facial colour, and fails to mention that she is his cousin. He also omits his own participation in the seances and dates them from 1899 to 1900, whereas they had started years before. What Richard Knoll claims later in his book is that Jung took these spiritualistic experiments so seriously that the ideas from them held sway over him longer than most of the instruction he received in medical school. He goes on to say that he felt that Heli's mediumistic trances gave him knowledge away from Heli herself recognising that these various personalities that emerged during her episodes in seance were real and engageable with dialogue. With this said, he supposedly did recognise that some of her behaviours were merely the cryptonesiac products of her own mind. In the book, he then states that these spirits or personalities displayed by Heli later characterised Jung's conception of the unconscious human mind, whereas Freud approached the products of the unconscious mind as hieroglyphs to be deciphered, Jung always regarded them as the starting place for a dialogue. In conclusion, he pretty much says that the idea of complexes and the unconscious were made out of these experiments later by Jung in Zurich 1916. 
which is kind of stating that most of Jung's work was founded out by these peculiar experiments done when he was a lot younger surrounding occult seances. With this said, there is a lot of controversy over this bibliography on Carl Jung when it comes to biased portrayal of his work and the tendency to make him out as a leader of his own sect, which idealised him as a god incarnate. But nevertheless, what is said is interesting when comparing it to what is said in Memories, Dreams and Reflections. I would highly recommend you check out both of these books of The Aryan Christ and The Secret Life of Carl Jung and MDR. If you want to look into this topic a bit more for your own research, but you should take The Aryan Christ book with caution and with a grain of salt. If you like this video, please give it a like, comment your thoughts down below and subscribe for more content surrounding Carl Jung's symbolism and psychology.